In the programme, Chasing the Wind, Dr Maggie Adairin talks about her work to measure the world's wind patterns, part of the global scientific community's effort to understand climate change. This programme outlines how Maggie's film can be used to explore how science works. I've been working on an instrument called Aladdin, which is part of a satellite called Aeolus. Now, Aeolus was the Greek keeper of the winds, and uh, so that's why the satellite is named after this. And that's exactly what Aeolus wants to do. It wants to look down through the Earth's atmosphere and measure wind speeds. And this will give us a better understanding of climate change and also give us better weather prediction. Maggie's programme covers a number of areas of the How Science Works programme of study. She looks at how ideas have changed over time. She also looks at the ways in which she develops instruments to collect data, to help us develop our ideas, explanations, theories of science. And she also introduces the implications of science. There are four How Science Works activities linked to Chasing the Wind. The rest of this programme concentrates on one of these activities, a role play on climate change. The other activities are in the accompanying curriculum materials. For the role play activity, the teacher, Matt Galvin, uses Maggie's film as a stimulus for the role play debate. Before we start, we'll have a video clip from the DVD. Uh, that's going to be looking at a woman called Maggie. Um, she is working on uh, satellite technology that will not only look out to space but also look towards um, planet Earth. And what she's focusing on is uh, how the wind um, direction and speed and so on at different levels of the atmosphere is, is changing over time. In the programme, Maggie has introduced many of the issues to do with climate change. And this acts as a really good stimulus to debate in the classroom. When dealing with debate in the classroom, a very useful approach to use is role play because it gives us an opportunity to address the issues in a balanced way so that the youngsters can see the arguments from both sides and then be able to make their own informed choices and decisions. For role play to be effective in the classroom, we need to go through the five phases of preparation, briefing, action, debriefing and follow-up. We must go through all of those phases and we must ensure that each phase is addressed effectively. Otherwise, the role play won't work and it means that all concerned are disappointed. Before showing students the film, the teacher is prepared for each stage of the subsequent role play debate. This includes everything from copying the roll cards and booking the computer access to thinking about classroom layout for the debate. Uh, team three and four there, and team one, if you could stand here. The briefing involves not only the outlining of the activity to the students, but crucially, getting them into role. Bear in mind that their role may clash with their personal opinion. Students should be grouped according to the role they have been assigned. In these groups, they prepare for the presentation, which will be given by a single member. Ultimately, there will be a five-minute PowerPoint presentation by each group. To prepare the student to give the presentation, there should be a hot seat session, plus some further work with the teacher to ensure they are all strongly in role. So which uh, speaker team are you then? Speaker two. Speaker two. So you think that uh, humans are to blame for climate change. Yeah. The opposition are going to be have some good questions. What do you think, what angles are they going to go for? What, how are they going to try and catch you out? Maybe about how there's quite a lot of evidence nowadays how uh, climate change has happened before many times and how it might just be natural. Okay. And I think also they'll try and use the ideas that there are lots of scientists going against it now as well as for the idea of global warming and that the media is putting across global warming as a device to make people do things, not as a real cause for the right. environment. Which speaker number are you? Number four. Number four. And you think that uh, climate change is happening but 
there's a positive side to it. Yeah. And um, what do you think that speakers one and two will be arguing against you? They're going to be like asking, oh, isn't climate change going to kill more people than it helps, or isn't it going to destroy environments, that kind of thing. But we've got a strategy. We've thought about what they're going to ask us, and we've prepared answers to everything. So okay. I think we've covered ourselves. So can you give me some, like, some different people? Give me some examples of what those questions might be. Um, won't many more species be wiped out than are saved by the increase in heat and the decrease in living space? OK. They might question our research because all of our research isn't scientific. Right. So they might kind of try and catch us out on that. OK, cool. Catch your instinct. Um, well, I think they'll probably just go on about, you know, how temperatures always change. So it's just another natural kind of earth thing that happens, like the ice age, but like the opposite kind of thing. Okay, great. I was just going to say, I'm sure we can prove them wrong, though. <laughs> <laughs> great stuff. Right, bro. Thanks very much. Although only one member of the group gives the presentation, the debate is set up to ensure that all of the class participate in the action phase. The other thing the students have to do is that those who are not going to present have to be prepared to be a member of the audience, an active member of the audience who will ask questions. Very often what happens is that the presenter, once all the experts have made their presentations, will say to the audience, right, would anybody in the audience like to ask a question? And there's either deathly hush or one or two students start to dominate. So the key way of, of overcoming this is to get each youngster to write their name, write their question, and who the question is for, which expert. You are then given a copy so that you can, as the presenter, prepare for the debate, and so that you can therefore prepare how many questions are asked expert one, how many expert two, and who's going to ask those questions. I invite the four speakers to come up. So that's uh, Catherine, Emily, Izzy and Jonathan. And they'll sit at the front, uh, teams one and two here, teams three and four here. Uh, they'll then do their presentation. It should be about five minutes or so with the aid of PowerPoint. And they'll try and convince you, the audience, that they're right um, and that the other teams are wrong. Okay. At the end of those four presentations, um, we'll have some questions. So I've got the questions that you wrote this week um, printed up. You've got a copy in front of you. The people who are answering the questions don't have a copy of the questions, um, so they won't be primed. So you might have to give them a little bit of time to come back with an answer, but they'll come back with a sensible answer to your question. Uh, at the end of that, uh, we'll summarise what the debate's been all about, uh, and then we'll have a vote, an audience vote, whether you think uh, climate change is occurring and whether you think we should uh, decrease our CO2 emissions. We're Human Footprint and we believe it is humans that have had a climate changing effect on our environment. We're going to show you why. Glaciers are melting, sea levels are rising, cloud forests are dying. That's our evidence. Let's look at the facts. Hello, I'm Emily and I'm a re representative of the Green Team. We're a team of environmentalist experts who work closely with the world scientists to raise awareness for the problems of global warming. So, what's causing this global warming? Carbon dioxide comes from a number of natural sources, mainly from the decaying of plants, volcanic eruptions, and waste products from animal respiration. Belief in global warming is nowadays almost universal. However, there is another belief that it is a bad thing, and this is wrong. I'm here today to prove to you that while global warming may have some bad effects, and they cannot be discounted, that overall, they have many more positive effects, which will help us. Fantastic, well done. So all, all four cases argued very strongly, and now it's your turn as an audience um, to ask some searching questions. How come the torrential rainfalls that we've been having in June 2007 have never happened before so heavily in South Yorkshire? And don't you think it relates to the rising temperatures in the atmosphere? No, in fact, they have happened before. Think back to the Great Flood of in the 1800s, I believe, and times before that as well. There have been many floods in South Yorkshire, especially in Sheffield. This is nothing to do with global warming. It's been happening for years and years, thousands of years into the past, and will continue to happen. And there's not really much we can do about it, but we can't really blame ourselves, can we? One of the arguments against global warming is that, uh, in fact, the temperature in the lower atmosphere is not actually rising 
Um, if this is true, then how do you explain the melting of the ice caps? The temperature in the lower atmosphere isn't rising, but the temperature on the Earth's surface actually is, and that's what's causing the melting of the ice caps. Do you have any proof that temperatures will actually rise by as much as 6 degrees in the next 50 to 100 years, as you said, and as is commercially believed? Is this not just a media myth? In my presentation, in our presentation, we didn't actually state that. But I can tell you that there is proof that uh, global warming is occurring. There is, um, we're burning gases. Um, we're burning fuels that are releasing harmful gases. It's trapping rays, um, so temperature is going to increase. And yes, the media might want to exaggerate things to get the message across to people because people do need to know about global warming as it is a serious issue and something needs to be done about it. You've heard all the arguments. Um, you've had a chance to uh, ask questions of the panellists. And now it's time for the audience vote to see what you think about... Uh, about the whole climate change argument. So I'm going to ask you two questions. How many of you think climate change is man-made? So that's about, about half or so? Maybe just over half, that's interesting. How many of you think we should be reducing our carbon emissions? Wow. So that's everyone bar Jonathan, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so the action phase should run very, very smoothly. Just one key aspect, though, is to try and make the debate environment as realistic as possible. So it, if it is going to be a TV debate, try and set it up like a studio. Once the action is complete, and this will generally be determined by the time you have available, you then must debrief. And that will come in two forms. One is debriefing what has happened during the action. So in other words, summarising what the different arguments were and also what questions were asked and the answers to those questions and the general feeling of the audience. The second is giving the youngsters an opportunity to come out of role and to think about the issues personally. So you could be asking youngsters to share with each other their experience, what role they took and whether they agreed with that role and what they actually think personally. OK, give yourselves a round of applause. You've been absolutely brilliant. <laughs> Top stuff. OK, that's it, folks. Uh, any sort of points to make or questions? With all the floods in Sheffield, the chances are that of them happening is increasing and increasing. They wouldn't have, all the water wouldn't have come down so suddenly if it wasn't so hot before. So they've all come down suddenly and like people have died from it. This wouldn't have happened if global warming wasn't going on and it wasn't getting so hot. So the idea of it just being a freak situation that's just happened, I don't think it's true. I reckon the media is just um, blown everything out of proportion and everyone's just reading things in papers and thinking this is um, global warming for definite when it's obviously, well not obviously, but it, there's other answers and it's not just global warming. I'm not saying you're bad people, I'm just saying that, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying that um, if it makes good stories and people buy it, so it's, a, it's you're doing it for a reason, so it's not necessarily true. I don't think that global warming is actually the issue here because it's Temperatures have gone up and down over the thousands and thousands and thousands of years that Earth has been. And they're not just going to change just because those humans have gone and put, like, you know, 2% extra carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. In order to keep the action phase flowing, it is not always appropriate to interrupt students who express scientific misconceptions during the debate. So the debrief phase is also a good opportunity to address these. Over the last 100 years, the human population has increased dramatically. More humans means more cars, which has obviously had a massive increase in the carbon levels. More carbon gases has helped make the ozone layer thicker. This traps more heat in. How can you not say that this is our fault? And finally, follow up. Giving the youngsters an opportunity to really consolidate what they've learnt from the activity, but also to be able to communicate what they think about the issue. And one approach is to get the youngsters to write an editorial article about the issue, 
where they summarise all the different aspects of the issue and then make a personal editorial comment. The curriculum notes for the role play activity suggest alternative discussion based approaches which you may wish to use with your students. A key to all of these however is the structure so that although the youngsters are having opportunity to express their own views to also express views in role the activity has a structure which means that you as a teacher don't lose control in the classroom. We asked Matt Galvin how useful he felt the activity had been for the pupils. I thought it was fantastic. I thought the kids uh, really raised their game um, for the debate. Um, they, they came up with some, fantastic, some great answers and they all seemed to walk out with a big smile on their face. So yeah, I, I, I enjoyed it greatly. I was really proud of them and I think they seemed to enjoy it as well. I think the, the debating skills themselves are very useful, obviously, in, in today's world. Um, I think importantly as well, they, they've had to structure it in quite a scientific way. So they've come up, they've, they've got an evidence base, um, and they've had to present that evidence in a way that people are going to understand, and then they've, they've put their arguments uh, together with that evidence underneath it. So I think it's a very important skill, um, if it's a scientific career they go into, or, or anything else. They'd obviously done a lot of work beforehand, thinking about what angles um, they needed to cover in terms of you know, what the opposition would ask them. I think um, they, learned, they learned a great deal. Um, some of their scientific arguments were very strong. and They'd obviously um, done a lot of research on the internet or, or wherever else they got their information. So I think there was, there was some solid science backing up their arguments.